so I was raised in Westchester and in high school I had a wonderful wonderful biology teacher named um, Phyllis Constan and she had done research before she had gotten married and had then become a teacher after she had had children so she was somebody who actually knew the scientific method and took great pleasure in it and I started doing experiments after school in the prep room with her and I did a series of experiments growing plants in the light and demonstrating that the light destroyed the auxins and the stem and that's why they grew toward the light not that they were growing toward the light but that the um, the auxins were destroyed by the light it's still fascinating and I then was doing a series of experiments that were treating tadpoles with various kinds of hormones I'm sure nobody would ever allow a child to do this now but I was 16 years old and doing this in the back room after school for fun and the the tadpoles were all in watch glasses which are open vessels and I had them all labeled and I was coming in every day and making my observations very diligently in my lab notebook and keeping track of measuring them and drawing little pictures it was I still remember it like it was yesterday and then I came in one day and somebody to help me had dumped them all into a bucket to wash the watch glasses so my whole all of my work was for naught and in my typical 16 year old way I was sitting on a step stool and I still remember this like it was yesterday in tears sobbing and she came in and asked what was wrong and I told her and she comforted me but she said to me she said you know you don't really belong here in high school anymore you really um, you can go to college even though you're a junior because you have an academic reason and you're academically you've done well you can apply and very good colleges will accept you she said you should talk to your parents so I did and I think there was a little bit of me that wanted to get out of the house as well I had pretty strict parents and um, I applied early to Radcliffe. My father was very insistent. My father was wonderful. He said, that's fine with him, but he didn't want me to compromise on where I went. So I applied early to Radcliffe and to Wellesley. And he said, don't tell anybody. Because if you get in, that's fine. But if you don't get in, you don't want to be embarrassed. So um, I did. And I didn't tell anybody. And then over, over the Christmas vacation, as it was approaching, Mrs. Constant came to me and she said, we have two tickets to these lectures at the Rockefeller University called Christmas Lectures. Now, I had never heard of the Rockefeller University and nor had my parents, but it was an opportunity to go for two days and listen to a Nobel laureate deliver lectures for high school students. And they were the two days after Christmas. There was nothing at that point in my life that would have seemed more exciting or made me happier. And so I took my ticket and I very diligently still have it. I, I still have my ticket. Um, there were two sessions on each of two days. They took the ticket for the first session, but I have the, the last three still in my, in my office. So I came here to the Rockefeller the day, I don't know if it was the day after or two days after Christmas in, in 1976. And Dr. Christian de Duve, who had just won the Nobel Prize in 1973 for discovering the microanatomy of the cell, gave a brilliant series of lectures on what he called the cytonauts. So we were making a tour like astronauts were up, up in space. We were inside a cell and we were on a tour of the cell. Very, in a lovely way, that those lectures were then compended into a Scientific American book, which I reread recently and is still absolutely wonderful. I was mesmerized by those lectures. Now, 40 years and more plus, I can remember examples he gave, I can remember slides he showed. They were brilliant, he was funny, he was extremely charming and engaging. And I think we were all just inspired beyond measure. I certainly was. And I came home and I told my parents, I, I wanna work there. I was expected to get a summer job and I said, you know, maybe they hire kids and I could get a job there. So my parents in, you know, people talk about helicopter and um, bulldozer parents now, I think the term. My parents weren't like that. They, they were wonderful, but they were like, okay, that's fine. Get a job. It wasn't their, um, their job to get me the job, but they were happy to support me in doing what I wished to do. So, so these are the last, the two days after Christmas. And then my mother 
just coincidentally went to a New Year's party. My mother is a physical therapist, and she was the head of physical therapy at the outpatient hospital at Burke Rehabilitation Center, which is a very important and wonderful rehabilitation center in Westchester. And she went to a holiday party with her colleagues, a New Year's Day party. And she came home and she said to me, the funniest thing happened. I was talking to my friend Ellie Einzig, who was the social worker, and we were talking about working hours and who worked hard and who had bad working hours. And she said her friend had a husband who had the worst working hours of anybody she knew and he didn't even take care of patients. And she said, and so I asked where he worked and she said he worked at the Rockefeller University. So she said, Ima imagine that, we hadn't heard of the place ever and now in a week we've heard of it twice. So I said to my mother, can you get me his phone number so I can call and see if he'll hire me? And she kind of thought about it and she said, well, I can ask Ellie to ask Claudia if, if that would be okay. And so Claudia was Claudia Steinman, Ralph Steinman's wife. And so my mother got me the phone number and I called out of a clear blue sky, Ralph Steinman at the age of 16 and asked him if I could work in the lab for the summer. So I, I still remember that conversation and he was, as he always was, sort of funny and generous and very kind. And he gave it some thought and he said that, you know, he would think about it. And, you know, he asked me some questions and where I was in school and all that. And he said he would think about it if they do hire students. And if he didn't call me by Valentine's Day, I should call him. So he called me on February 12th, Lincoln's birthday. And he said, yes, indeed, I could come work in the lab, but they couldn't afford to pay me. So Ralph was among the most frugal people I ever knew. And um, he said, we can't pay you, but we can pay, um, we'll give you meal tickets for the cafeteria. At that point there were meal tickets that students had for the cafeteria and I guess they could be purchased somehow by the labs. And we will pay for your commutation. So we'll reimburse you out of petty cash for your commutation ticket, which was $34 a month. I still remember that. And what he didn't know is I would have worked for him and paid him, but it was good he didn't know that because he probably would have wanted that then. And I started working for him that summer. I was 17, he was 34. And through the rest of our lives, if the two of us were alone in a room, I was 17 and he was 34. Um, he was still at the bench. His lab was 413 Bronc. He had um, a lovely technician named Beverly Mactinger who worked with him. And I don't think he, at that point, he had any graduate students of his own. He would come to have many, some of whom I'm still dear friends with. But at that point, um, and his postdoc, his first postdoc, Lei Chen, I think came the next year or the year after. I, I came to work and I showed up and the first thing he did was taught me how to kill mice <laughs> and how to take their spleens out and make dendritic cells from the mice, the mouse spleens. And um, we sat together across the table and did that um, for a lot of that summer. He taught me how sterile technique, how to work on, on, with an open um, Bunsen burner flame and flaming the, the mouth of the media. He taught me how to work in the hood. He arranged for me to work with um, somebody who worked in the lab and I, I started to learn electron microscopy. He thought that would be a good skill for me to have. It was, it was lovely, but um, didn't ever really prove to be terribly useful, but I enjoyed doing it. Um, but he was a remarkable teacher, and he was a remarkable scientist in that not only was he completely passionate about what he did, people talk about that, but he was, he observed in a way that I've not, don't know that I've ever seen anybody else observe. 